Hey everyone, I'm super excited to be speaking to Florence Evans. Uh, Flory is a mudlarker extraordinaire. Uh, she is also uh, well followed on Instagram under account under Flo Finds. Uh, she also runs an independent gallery representing artists as well as an art collector herself. Flory, welcome. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you for the little pricey, which sounds very grand when you put it like that. <laughs> but honestly, I'm not tall and I don't technically have a gallery. I do pop-ups. Pop-ups. Well, yes. an independent representation, exactly, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. So thinking about mudlarking, one of the things I've really loved about walking down the river is the connection with nature, something both man-made, I guess, with the bank and the foreshore and also the connection with history a time and a place one person's rubbish being another person's treasure what do you think perhaps for you is most underrated about mudlarking or walking on the river well i think that a lot of londoners don't realize that they have the river as a place to go and as a refuge which makes me sad I mean I think more and more people are discovering it thankfully but um, you know I was very fortunate I grew up near the river and my mum who is Australian and from Sydney always said that she had to live near water so as a child she would take my brother and I down to have walks along the foreshore and that felt very special but I don't think many people necessarily realise that they can go down onto the banks of the Thames or they think that you have to kind of climb down a ladder to get down there but actually there are numerous access points so um, it is a place that needs to be um, visited more and I think when you do go down it is an extraordinary experience because as you say there's this sense of um, nature in the middle of the city um, and a connection um, with the city's past. I mean you, you, you can't escape the fact that you know you're walking upon detritus centuries old detritus whether it's old bricks or broken bits bits of pipe stem or um, plastic that was chucked into the river yesterday I mean it is it's a, a very specific terrain and it has a very specific smell as well I should add I mean I I love the smell of the River Thames I imagine for some people, that's a horrendous thought, <laughs> but but um, it, it's kind of slightly briny. It, it it has elements of the seaside to it, and I do think of parts of the foreshore as being like a beach. And in fact, my daughter calls it the beach because where we live in East London, um, the stretch of river by Wapping is very sandy. So um, yeah, it's a connection with nature, and it's a connection with the city, and it's quite a sort of special space it does feel like a beach to me so in london fortunately or unfortunately today people in the video can see this you will need a pass you do need to get a license from the pla to go um, mudlarking and i think they are currently as of the end of 2022 kind of full up because there's yeah. a, a, over 5,000 uh, licenses but uh i guess when recently thinking about fines the last time i was the river i don't go so often talking about the the pipes here again on the video you can see there's these little uh, stem pipes and i think for a lot of people and certainly for me it was one of the first fines uh, and i still get excited uh, and my son still gets excited when he finds one uh, i'm also on the ever lookout for a bead and I haven't found an interesting bead and I know famously you always hunt for beads and you have I some do. amazing ones beads. so uh, maybe the question would be uh, what are your kind of most exciting finds or quirky finds or those that you you've had and um, maybe you can talk about your love of beads yeah sure um well it's interesting that you say that one of the first things you found was a clay pipe stem because one of the first things I ever found as a child was a clay pipe stem and I didn't really know what it was. And I was mentioning to you earlier actually that um, 
I first made the connection when I went on a school trip to Hampton Court and saw some examples of clay pipes that they had found under the Tudor kitchens from the time of Henry VIII. And I went, oh my God, those are what I've been finding by the river. And that was very exciting to me. It was a tangible piece of archeology. span um, And from there I started to kind of realize that the river had these little scraps of history to be found. Um, and then I think I started looking more carefully and I remember um, a particular find, one of my first, again after the pipe stems, was a Venetian Miller Fury bead um, and I don't have it today unfortunately. I. I can't be sure whether it wasn't just dropped off someone's 1980s earring <laughs> or whether it was some amazing Renaissance trade beat. I will never know. But for me, that was a very exciting find. And, and today I do make a point of looking for beads. And again, where I live in East London, um, I have found an area which is rich in trade beads. Um, trade beads have quite a dark history they were used um, as a commodity to trade with indigenous peoples in the Americas and in Africa because in these um, places the Europeans worked out they, they didn't know how to make glass and so a bead was seen as a very precious object and of course they were small and they were portable um, and they would sell them for what was considerably a what would have been thought of as a high price. So you could buy literally slaves in Africa with beads. Wow. So some of them are known as slave beads, particular types of beads. You could buy beaver pelts from Native Americans because obviously um, fur was hugely coveted over here, but also incredibly important over there in the, the harsh winters that they were prepared to sell the pelts for these tiny little glass beads. So they tell a story that is fascinating and I think is important to be brought to light today so that we understand um, what colonialism did and um, how our ancestors um, conquered if you want to call it um far-flung places and people and I, I mean i i just the mind boggles really when you think of beads in that way wow i hadn't i hadn't heard that full story in their history like that and it walking down the river it also does and these objects really brings home how what humans value is a part of the myth and the story, you could say this about money. Money's a mm. trust thing. You can't even touch it digitally and, and we've given it value. Mm. And we have in London this idea of a peppercorn rent because peppercorns used to be extremely valuable mm. and actually they're not so valuable anymore. And things like beads or whatever we've had to represent used to be very valuable. They might have had a certain meaning, a dark meaning or a light meaning. Mm. And we can reinterpret that today. And sometimes we don't even understand what what we're looking at or, or what it means i think that connection's really amazing i had once found a piece of flint which i thought had been fairly worked on so i did wonder how old it would be but other people thought maybe it hadn't been worked on uh that long but what's the oldest thing then you might have found that because some of the worked flint could be over a couple of thousand years old like going going back that far yeah i would say i have quite a considerable collection of worked flint tools um, neolithic scrapers and um, cores and things like that um, not an arrowhead yet unfortunately <laughs> um, but yes i would say my flint tools are my oldest finds definitely and that's i guess because there used to be communities all during that time which lived on the river lived from the river and, mm. and by the river and all of that absolutely i mean this is it the river um is a place where you know people always have to settle near water um, and it gives life literally but also it's used as a dump where you chuck things as well so it's kind of this um, 
wonderful contradiction um, in a way. The river sees um, communities flourish and grow and it sees communities kind of um, not not the demise of but it, it's just seen the ebb and flow of time and people and um, I, I find that quite interesting. And this is very London centric and it's got a particular rich history. In fact I think there have been mudlarkers for several hundred years where the treasure of treasure hunters of 300 years ago were looking for different sorts of treasure today but I was on a beach or a foreshore I guess in an American city and found not very old detritus but uh, I guess you can mudlark kind of anywhere in some of those sort of, sort of history although I guess river cities are always going to be the richest have you and I and people do these bottle bank kind of hunting and kind of rubbish uh, dump sort of hunting so have you done any other type oh, of yes, hunting I, like that I do I, I go digging in Victorian and Edwardian bottle dumps um, on the outskirts of London to find the sort of vintage bottles and things because I, I you know I have a, an endless desire to find <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm a I'm a regular womble um, I just like picking stuff up <laughs> and digging shit up <laughs> use my language um, yeah so um but it is it is a recreational drive today and i think it's an important distinction that you made in the past mudlarks in fact the term mudlarking is is a victorian term for um the d destitute um people of london in victorian times who would go looking for um things like old rope to sell lumps of coal things that had um, fallen off off ships when they were being um, unloaded or packed you know they were looking for things that they could trade and sell um, or even just food they 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 saw the river and mudlarking as a source of income um, and often it was sort of poor children who would sort of go into the muddy um low tide without even any boots or shoes on because often they could feel things with their feet in the mud um, and and use their feet almost as as a sort of sensory way of finding things how extraordinary um but then i mean it goes back beyond there um there are 17th century and 18th century drawings and engravings of um, people looking for Roman finds um, uh, for the antiquarian collectors and you would get locals um, wading um, in the Medway um, on the Kent coastline um, uh, looking for Roman pots using kind of long pikes um, to kind of dig into the mud to feel for pot shards underneath. Wow. Um, and so, you know, it's been going on for centuries. And, and um, I should add, actually, also the the poor little destitute Victorian children who would look for um, things to, to sell in from the river would sometimes come across artefacts which they would sell to antiquarian dealers. So, um, you know, there have always been treasure yeah. hunters. But in those days, it was generally rich people paying the impoverished to go out and mm. find the treasure for them rather than get their hands dirty mm. themselves and this i'm sorry to go mm. off on a tangent um brings to mind um an amazing picture that i handled a, a couple of years ago by an artist called walter greaves and it is a very detailed painting of um chelsea um, the Chelsea Embankment from 1876 showing the Chelsea Regatta and there were numerous people that he drew on the foreshore watching the race and they were all men there were no women down on the foreshore and that's another thing to remember you know women wouldn't have wanted to um, get their skirts mm. muddy it would have been considered indecorous to go down there only um, you know, women, destitute women and mudlocks would have gone down onto the riverbank. But, you know, if you had any sense of decorum, you wouldn't go down at low tide unless to watch a race and you were a man. Wow. Gosh, so it, 
shows everything about our history, both gender, trade, colonialism and everything. And that brings to mind a, a couple of things. One is how oysters used to be a peasant, a poor person's food, mm -hmm. similar type of things before it kind of changed through. And I also wonder, what do you think, do you think the Romans themselves would have mudlocked? And I wonder what they would have mudlocked for. Uh, I guess it might have been yeah. too early, but I imagine they were on the river and they did find oh, things. Oh, God, yes. I mean, it, it's interesting because there are pockets of London where you find lots of Roman detritus. Um, and obviously that's because they um, were very active in the centre of London and that was where Londinium kind of rose up from the river by St Paul's, that kind of area. Um, but yeah, what did they find? I imagine, again, there must have been always trade on the river and there would have been mudlarks and locals looking for um, things that had been dropped off the boats. Of course, there will always be opportunists. Yeah, even in one day. I think mm. so. The most valuable thing that I found, which wasn't very valuable, was a half penny from I think the 1950s or 60s when we still had half penny. But I think you know, if you were a mudlark, from it, people would have been dropping coins, and if you find Absolutely. find a coin, that would have been your week or maybe even your month if it was a a, a particularly good coin. Absolutely. And um, another thing to to mention with regards to coins. Um, Obviously, you had all the dockers who would be dropping their halfpennies and things as they were loading and unloading um, boats. But um, there are certain parts of the river where there were spectacles, such as the regatta, and you would get people going down and, and dropping um, coins from their pockets. But um, also there were kind of your London pickpockets who, just as today, you know, might sort of, steal someone's wallet and then throw it into the river you would presumably have that happening um, and things being thrown in the river um, as you can imagine a kind of um, Fagin type character um, or one of his children stealing things suddenly realizing they're going to get caught chucking it in the river to then go and retrieve it later on yeah. at low tide and I can um, imagine that's been yeah, happening for thousands going, of years. All sorts going yeah. on, yeah. Interesting. And um, I'm just thinking outside of London for one moment. Are there any other cities which are as famous for mudlarking? I, I, are American cities too young? And I, I guess some European ones must have a... I guess it helps having a tidal river. I'm only thinking out loud. Mm. I haven't discovered this long enough. But are there other famous cities for mudlarking? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it is really helpful if you have a tidal river because obviously you can go down and 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 search the river banks there are mudlarks in the north of england um in edinburgh as well um and scotland and um then in america there is a lot of mudlarking that goes on around new york um for kind of art deco treasures okay um and probably the place I would most like to go mudlarking but it's not tidal and it requires actual diving <laughs> is in the Netherlands <laughs> in Amsterdam there are amazing amazing treasure hunters there who literally go into the canals dive and bring out all these Dutch golden age um, artifacts which put all the things from the Thames to shame honestly they're bringing out complete onion bottles from the 17th century um, amazing complete delftware tiles um, all sorts of extraordinary things and 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 there's a real community of of dutch mudlarks but uh, you know they're, so they're beyond hardcore. mudlarking yeah. they're hardcore they go <laughs> they go down and they dive and it's incredible what they find wow that's the that's the next that's the next step mm. uh, so that brings me to this little piece of glass uh, that we found. Actually, Anishka, my partner, found it. And it's, it's a piece of nothing, right? It's a bit of rubbish, but we really loved it because it had these words. You can only make out society and limited. And we saw there's a couple double OP. Uh, and so we looked it up and it was the co-op society. And we puzzled it out that it was an old uh, milk bottle from, I think, the 1930s or something like that. And what's great about these little things, whatever you find, if you have a little bit of something, mm. there's a puzzle and a history that you can figure out. Um, 
uh, from something like sort of medium to easy hard like that to really complicated things what's the best thing that you ever puzzled out Oh, gosh, that's a difficult question. You're right. These pieces of social history, which you don't learn about in school books, these kind of little personal stories that you get from written text are so satisfying to find and and puzzle out. Um, But I have to admit that the finds that sort of fire me up are historical costume, which don't necessarily have the little clues with the writing and, and the, the, the maker's marks. But, you know, having said that, um, I have a vast collection of buttons and on the backs of buttons, you'll often have the maker's name and an address. Um, and so you can um, have a deep Google and <laughs> find um, the details or sometimes, um, you know, the birth and death dates of, of the tailors who made these buttons and and that's always fascinating it you can go down um a rabbit hole with with those um and can you do that even without a mark because the shape and style are of a time absolutely so you learn um sort of the the fashions for different periods and so you 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 learn to expect um a certain shape for a certain period for instance in the 18th century um, buttons became very large and flat um, so if you imagine a gentleman's waistcoat it would have these big shiny flat buttons um, and so they're very easy to date um, because it was specifically a fashion of, of the time of the era um, or um, for a Tudor period button it's generally quite globular and small and 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 round um, and often decorated and then um, in the 17th century button makers realized that they could make buttons um, they're called blowhole buttons that are hollow so they're still round but they use less metal and therefore they're more economic to make um, it less less metal used cheaper um, all round, cheaper to sell, and um, you know, saving on materials. So you can you can definitely learn a lot about um, what period something might have come from by how it was made. I remember viewing a series of mudlarked knives and hadn't realised that the style of knife tells you a lot. And actually, mm. then if you find it with something else, you can really date that uh, that period. And and I'm. Uh, and I'm told it's also the same with uh, shoes. So shoes date really precise, even modern day shoes. Because you see this with uh, trainers that you have, you know, they're only in, sold in a two or three year period. So you, if you see one in a photo, you can really tell roughly when roughly when that was. That's right. Um, and in fact, actually, one of my favorite finds that I have is a complete child's Tudor shoe. And wow. um, it's a very specific shape um, that apart from the fact that the leather is very fragile and soft um it it has this um wonderful kind of pointy toe which is typical for the period um so that's one of my favorite finds also the idea of a child's shoe how did it end up in the river um you can play out all sorts of scenarios in in your mind wow what's the kind what's the last What's the one you want to find that you haven't found? So you mentioned uh, an arrowhead. I'd still love to find a bead. I'd love to find some worked flint, which I could definitively say uh, was old. Um, I'd like to find a whole glass bottle, but partly because I think glass often breaks, so getting a whole one is going to be tricky. Mm. Although actually glass bottles are incredibly well preserved in the deep mud, so maybe you're not going into the muddy and... Yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm yeah. I'm mostly around Hammersmith and just walking on the top, which is a well walked yeah. bit. So it's not. Yeah. Um, I, I probably need a lucky storm to have uh, put something up. I need to go east one day or, or, or something like to, that. Or, or you need to head towards Chiswick um, yes. from Hammersmith because there are lots of bottles down that way as well. I'm giving secrets <laughs> away. Oh, no. <laughs> Walk all, everywhere uh, <laughs> along the river. Yeah. So what would you? Uh, well, yeah, what do you still lack in your collection, which what you would love? What do I right? lack? Um, I am very lucky because I have, I, I like to think of myself as 
been quite a good all-rounder but I have time on my side which is that I've been doing this for years and years and years and years so I have um, a well-stocked collection um, I have found most things Ben that sounds really <laughs> awful but I have I found most things um, what would I really love to find a complete onion bottle would That's be not would be a bucket list find for me um i just love the shape of of the bottle i mean for anyone who doesn't know an onion bottle is a 17th century style of wine bottle and it looks like an onion it's globular and it has a flat base and i mean there's an apocryphal tale whether this is true or not i think it probably isn't true but i like it that um, they were designed to be bottom heavy so that mm. when um, ships went out to sea um, they didn't roll around on on the captain's table you would have a heavy bottomed flat bottomed bottle that would kind of be there in the center of the captain's table and all the sailors could help themselves to a drink from it which is quite a that's why you have to learn to dive and go to Holland. Yes, to get, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'd love to find one of those. Um, I love finding worked bone artifacts. And um, until recently, I had never found a complete but worked bone knit comb. And I found one from the 1600s wow. this year. So that was a bucket list item ticked. Um, but thinking of worked bone, I have found over the years numerous um, bone dominoes and um, gaming pieces but I have never found a Roman bone um, gaming piece wow. so I would like to find a, yeah. um, a Roman game and they're printer. medium common or they're, fi they're, they're medium findable common. they're findable the problem is I don't generally like mudlarking in the centre of London where, where one finds oh, them because it's too overcrowded for mm. me. I go to the river also for Fun. kind of peace, <laughs> yeah. for peace nature. And, and nature and and to kind of be by myself and for headspace. Um, so I'm not someone who likes to go and mudlark next to the hordes, mm. but I feel like I should probably go a bit more often into the centre of town and then I might find my bucket list mm. Roman gaming counter. But until then... I don't think I ever will find it. <laughs> so, uh, Talking about groups, we should mention that actually uh, group visits, uh, is it Thames Discovery? That's that right. They do tours. So if you're just yeah. interested in coming for a day in London or you're London and just want to try it, you're not going to do this every week and queue up for a license. Uh, that's one way yeah. of getting a taste for it and a little bit of history. And I wouldn't say absolutely certain, but you're very likely to find at least a pipe stem i think every time i go uh, we still find the pipe stem and we're not even in a very particular rich bit either yeah. walking along hammersmith or by the tape modern well you guys must be eagle-eyed because not everybody finds a pipe stem they're oh. there to be found but they're they do blend in to the pebbles so you have to be in tune um, and I recommend to anyone who is interested in going mudlarking and doing something with Thames Discovery while they can't get a license, they can do the Thames Discovery group tours to have a look at what these things look like online so that then you know what to look for. I think you have to, to you know, have an idea. Yeah, if, that's true. If, if you had never seen a clay pipe stem, and I should add these are the fag butts of yesteryear, they? they're from literally clay smoking yeah, they do look a little bit pipes. like cigarettes they do they look do like they? cigarettes yeah you need to but you if you haven't seen seen them you you might not necessarily know to pick them up yeah i agree mm. um and maybe we'll finish on this part les you brought some of your own finds with I you did. is there one you'd like to share yeah i brought in several things but but i do love glassware there's something about glass that really does it for me. And I thought I would show you my 17th century apothecary bottle, which w is tiny. And it's like a miniature onion bottle, actually. Um, but it uh, would have contained some kind of quack cure. God knows what medicine went in mm. that. This is amazing. So for those not on the video, it, the glass has a really beautiful uh, translucent quality with 
kind of greeny, very slightly oily rainbow colours. And it has this kind of handmade quality because it's not quite regular. Only very slightly off regular, but it gives it a kind of really uh, unique joy. And it's really tactile, like you have it in your fingers and it feels like it has definitely been touched by or met, shaped by humanness. I, I guess it was blown rather than with fingers, but yeah. because of that uh, very slight unevenness, um, there's a real quality of being connected to another human, just me uh, me touching this and, and looking at it. Exactly. It's hand blown and um, it has been squidged by the bottle maker to be slightly cuboid. So while the glass was still malleable, um, as it was cooling, they've kind of um, pinched it, and that's why it has this tactile quality, I think. Oh. So they've pinched it into this slightly sort of square shape um, and then um, left it to cool. And, yeah, the, the, it, it has such a fascinating hidden story that we'll never know. So from the glass maker, the glass blower to the apothecary, what they chose to put in it, to the person who bought it to cure, I don't know, the Black Death, let's say, yeah. maybe, <laughs> who knows, what they want, what their aspiration was that this medicine would cure. Um, did and it work? Probably mm. not. And you've dated it from 1600s? So this, is, this is from the 1600s, yeah. probably the mid to late 1600s. And how can we tell? from the tint of the glass yeah, the kind yeah. of wonderful aqua color um from the way it's been made the shape mm. and um on the bottom this kind of kick up and rough bit is called the pontil scar and that's where um you have the scar from where it was blown mm. and cut off the sort of piece of glass um and by the 18th century, they had worked out how to make glass completely transparent, mm. flint glass, which has a slightly gray color to a modern eye, but which was considered to be transparent then. Um, but this still has that kind of slightly greeny aqua color of the earlier glass. This was as close as they could get um, in the 1600s and before then to, to transparent. That's amazing. Yeah. So I would take something like that. And today, if we put it on a little plinth or had it in a in a gallery, uh, I think a lot of us would call it art. And I guess there's always been in through history a kind of where does craft become art? But I think even more so when we think about finds or there's a whole modern day sequence of found objects or found art mm. or uh, I guess from I guess earlier but from the time of Duchamp's famous uh, toilet or technically urinal where he, he takes it and puts it on a plinth and calls it art and therefore becomes art. Um, what do you think about how much if an artist or if anyone says something that they created or even found or placed um, is art um, do we really think that's art and how does that change then things through time? And I guess I ask it partly because it links into this, but uh, I meet a lot of people today who think, oh, a lot of this modern art or go into postmodern doesn't seem to be art to them uh, because it doesn't have some of that craft skill based. Mm. But people sort of read into how some modern art has gone and think about it, does value it in things like art and in that language of art. So. I was wondering of your perspective of long art history and yeah. obviously you're very learned within uh, mudlarking and objects, but also within modern art, even into masters and classics and how that's been viewed for time. So is art always art if an artist calls it such? Well, that's a very big question, <laughs> but <laughs> that perhaps I can't fully answer. I think if someone create something and decides that they want it to be viewed as art you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and it will be a piece of art if if it's been created with artistic intent whether you think it's any good is another matter yeah. um but there are it is interesting there are a lot of artists today who um are fascinated by 
craft from the past and m who work specifically with mudlarked finds. In fact, um, I think there's an exhibition um, on view at Tate Modern at the moment, which I haven't been to see yet, um, an installation of objects um, displayed by an artist um, and their objects that she found in the Thames. Um, I wish I could tell you who this artist is. I'm so sorry, everybody. I haven't been to see it yet. And someone just mentioned it to me in passing the other day and said, oh, you should go and see. Um, but, you know, there we go. There's a whole um, mudlarked display in Tate Modern. Um, so I think that sort of answers your question there. Um, one of my sort of happiest um, achievements in my career um, thus far was curating an exhibition on mudlarking and mudlarked art in 2019 for the Totally Thames Festival. Um, and that was um, an exhibition that I put on um, showing art um, by artists featuring mudlarked finds, still life photographs um, by Hannah Smiles, a photographer of mudlarked finds and portraits of mudlarks as well that she had taken. And that was in the um, Barge House, which is a massive warehouse space on the south bank by the Oxo Tower, so right by the river. Um, and that was a joy to be asked to do that. And it, it felt like it was a fusion of both my kind of passion hobby mudlarking and um, what I do in work which is curate and look at art and so um, that that was a fusion of of art and mudlarking and looking at craft and elevating it um, to to art and looking at history and saying this is part of who we are as human beings we create um, there is an impulse and an urge to, to make things of beauty, even things that are um, utilitarian, there's beauty to be found. And that kind of links back to the philosophy of someone like William Morris, who believed that um, art should always be useful and beautiful. Um, yes, and we were talking earlier about how there are these human impulses children throwing stones in the river, people leaving handprints in wet mud or cement, maybe cave painting handprints, maybe it's the same impulse. And this impulse to be with nature and things. And I wonder, so some of my friends who don't really like or appreciate uh, modern art kind of think that is not saying anything around that. But a lot of people who are into modern art or postmodern art kind of think, well, actually, there is a story and, and language, uh, which maybe half of it is in the kind of uh, the viewers part, we call it, I guess, the beholden part. And maybe this is one reason that part of me is not too worried about um, AI, artificial intelligence generated art, because mm -hmm. although you have the visual picture, there's a portion of any picture or object like we've discussed, which has this whole other value or story or narrative behind it mm -hmm. and what we make of it, whether it's to your earlier story about the dark side of beads mm -hmm. or the light side of, of costume making. And it will always need a human or an audience or a reader to complete that. Yet I also worry sometimes that maybe some modern art or postmodern art has gone so far that they've left a lot of people behind because they've been working and building on all of these stories and every generation goes um, a bit further. Um, I know you started off in old masters, but now you also deal uh, with modern and living artists and things. Mm. Do you think this is much of a worry and do you find people outside of the art world um, are do you think they're correct to be worried that they don't understand modern art or is this always one of those things a bit like these finds which you need to sort of puzzle it out and appreciate to get perhaps the most out of it although there's always a, a, a surface tactile craft quality as well well i think that there are tiers of art um, and what we mustn't forget is that ultimately there's a real human connection with beauty 
And so conceptual art aside, which is which serves an important purpose and helps us to think and, and challenges us in many ways. Um, on the other hand, there's a human need, I think, a kind of nesting instinct to have art for the home, things of beauty to lift your spirits. Um, and, and I think that's really elemental. And I certainly found as an art dealer um, that sort of post COVID coming out of lockdown, a lot of people had been in their homes going a bit stir crazy looking at their walls and had been rearranging their homes in their mind's eye. And um, there was a kind of frenzied fever of um, art buying that happened um, both online during lockdown and immediately after lockdown, people had been art starved and commercial art galleries were the first galleries to open um, because businesses um, were given special dispensation by the government, you know, commerce um, had to carry on eventually. So um, they opened before museums and galleries. And as a result, I was working in a gallery at the time, the, the kind of influx of visitors, the number of people who wanted to come just to see art, it was a massive uptick. And I think that that was a direct result of people being in their home and feeling the need to kind of rearrange their nests, but also to get out and see art again. And, and they had felt starved of art and a need for beauty and a need to look at beautiful things to distract from what might be happening in, in the world. Um, so I think that art has a very important place and people haven't actually become disconnected from it. Um, but, but there is very much a difference between conceptual and AI um, and, and what you materially might have in the home and I include craft in that. Um, but sort of looking again at instinct um, I think so much of what I love and what I do is is an instinct and um, you you're either a collector or you're not but there's a definite sort of core group of people who are fascinated and want to collect and want to find and look at things and my mum tells me that as a um, small baby once I'd learnt to crawl I would go out into the garden and bring stones back in and arrange them under the kitchen table and I'd be nipping in and out all the time kind of creating installations of stones under the kitchen table like nesting is what she called it you know she says that as a, as a little baby I just wanted to nest and create dens with things that I had found that wasn't something that um, was influenced by home life per se that was surely at that age an instinct wow amazing yeah i think we do have that instinct to some degree in, in all of us that leads me to think what it what are the kind of pieces of art that you have in your own uh home or flat i guess you're going to like all of them because that's why they're <laughs> that's why they're there but maybe you would highlight uh, some pieces you have or what they mean to you or um perhaps what they brought to you during pandemic or out of pandemic how how you thought about uh, your own collecting within art yeah. for the home well um i i i definitely have a philosophy which is that i never buy any art that i wouldn't want to have on my own walls um and indeed when i buy art now that's where it goes but at the same time nothing is a permanent part of my collection or home everything is fluid I'm an art dealer so I buy art that I can sell and I buy art that I'll sit on for years and then sell down the line and I'll enjoy it um, and then it will be time to let it go and find it a new home and bring something else in so it's a constant state of flux um, but a painting that I recently acquired that means a lot to me um, is a view of Hastings where as a family um, we go every summer to spend time and it's by a wonderful artist called Letitia Yap who is half Chinese half v Viennese and she has um, lived and worked as an artist in Hastings for the last sort of 
55 years um, and she does these beautiful um, figurative paintings um, often um, sort of fishermen on the beach um, but this is actually a view from the window of her home looking out at the the cliff um, a very specific cliff where I've been for long family walks um, so it has resonance for me um, because it, it represents a place that is special um, to me and my partner and our daughter lovely what do you look for in art or an artist then so you have a nesting instinct piece there's also an eye to maybe there's going to be value longer term I guess that's yeah, the market to, commercial, commercial piece as well yes, yeah um, uh, and then there's kind of the meaning and the symbolism and, and all of that but how uh, I guess it's got to speak to you but if you're thinking uh, to maybe represent an artist in a, in a pop-up gallery or a piece to collect um, what goes through your mind when you're um, looking or handling a piece of art or talking to an artist well again I think a lot of it is just gut reaction and that sounds very unscientific but um, you know we all like to think that we've got good taste um, but it's all relative I mean all I can do is look for art that speaks to me and I see beauty in and I'm I, I suppose because my grounding as you mentioned briefly is an old master's I am interested in artists today who use techniques that, um, you know, bridge the centuries. Um, so I am interested in art where you're looking at a painting and it's a picture of something and you can say, yes, that is a portrait of a person or a landscape. I mean, I do like abstract art as well, um, but then in in something like that it would have to be a composition that has balance and color that I like um, but I'm afraid it's it's an entirely personal cocktail that's impossible to kind of quantify or sort of specify really I guess that's one of the joys that it hasn't been brought to just an algorithm or something yeah. that you can <laughs> yeah. count yeah. Uh, in in numbers or uh, things uh, like that um, and I guess thinking about art like that I'm probably because my day job is within the market much more amenable to thinking about art markets and culture markets I think uh, I think artists in general or creators are, are, are probably on average undervalued because of the way we've done it but I think it is important to have that value but I know a lot of my arty friends um, have a very uncomfortable relationship with the market because they think quite rightly that a lot of the things that they produce are in some ways beyond a measurable value like the things we've talked about are very hard to put in words and you don't put uh, in numbers and there, there is there is something slightly awkward about putting uh, a price on it. Yet, in so many things human, uh, markets are also our invention and there are this invention of being able for people to exchange in some sort of value these intangible things which are hard, uh, which are hard to count. But do you have a view, I guess with a commercial background, you're probably going to be also uh, at least somewhat amenable to art markets, having dealt yeah. with them your entire lifetime. Um, but yeah, is there anything un, un misunderstood about art markets or how artists should think about approaching uh, a market or their work or something which is like maybe more valued? I, I think it's very easy to make the argument against them, just saying, look, these things are priceless and, and valuing them somehow makes it awkward. Um, but I think it's often less talked about that the that the value of markets that they can bring, and I'd be just intrigued as to if you have to have any of these debates with with artists and people. Well, I should really say at this point that I do deal with living artists, but my expertise really is in historic art, and my main dealing now is with um, mid twentieth century works of art, modern British art. So um, a lot of the paintings that I buy and sell are by artists who are no longer alive. Um, I am particularly drawn to works from the 1920s, 30s, 40s. I love high art deco design and I love what was happening um, in art at that time. Um, 
and I find the history interesting as well. Um, so that's a market that has really blossomed and grown over the last um, 10, 15 years. And um, a lot of um, the paintings that I um, deal in now um, are, are by um, artists who, you know, you could have bought their work 10, 15 years ago for nothing, but now you have to pay a price. Um, and auction houses have a, um, a really big role to play there because I think that they set the basic level at which people are prepared to spend um, in an art market. So, you know, there are auction records. You can look online and see what a particular artist's works might have fetched in the last year or two and you can kind of or even the last decade and you can um, look on some a, a website called Artnet um, at, at kind of auction records for the last 10-15 years on a particular artist so you can see how the market has changed or grown um, and um, you know it that that really is the litmus test um, but with contemporary art, I, I tend not to deal with um, contemporary artists um, of kind of the, who, who are, I don't know, kind of super trendy where you're talking Gagosian level right. <laughs> um, prices. Yeah. That is a market I don't understand and I have no interest in. Um, you know, the kind of artists that I deal with today who are living, um, as I say, they tend to be rooted in the past um, and um, as such often that I, they're kind of what I would call late career artists, people who were working in the 20th century and um, are still active today, but, you know, who have a kind of back catalogue, so to speak, um, and already have a market themselves, already have a level at which they're used to selling their works. Um, having said that, you know, I would love to represent sort of young emerging artists as well um, and students and help to kind of guide them. Um, if you have a good connection. Yeah, if I think that the, the work is, is beautiful and, and worth pushing, I will. Um, but I have an old boss who always used to say to me, Flory, willing buyer, willing seller. And I know that sounds... <laughs> A bit ridiculous, but it's true. Ultimately, all you can do is say what you think something is worth and then it will flow from there and you may have to end up in a scenario where you haggle or you kind of, you, you reach a mutual point of agreement. Um, but markets are fluid, but in the end, you just need someone who wants that piece of art and who's prepared to pay the price that you think it's worth. And why has 1920s, 1930s British art flourished and do auction houses or galleries in general, what is their role in the curation that may then actually impact value or even just the stories? I guess that's not just auction houses and galleries. That would be our public galleries and, and national uh national art places as well although again there's probably a split between contemporary and living and and, and that is it just market forces of demand or is there some story as to why that art has suddenly become more noticeable and i, I guess the other part i look at very afar so i'm interested in art don't track the market but it seems to me that artists or art which was perhaps historically more underrepresented whether that's uh, women-led art or um, art outside of um, Western art or normal domains is also lifted. And you can see that as a, a reflection of mm -hmm. a society movements, although obviously the, there's a range. Um, so I, I speculate, I wonder whether that's had anything to do with it. But I'd uh, be interested in your thoughts as to why it happens um, well, uh, I, now. I think that, um, you know, it's recent enough history that people can relate to it. Um, visually and I think a lot of um, our taste today is informed by the last hundred hundred years and what we're used to seeing whether it's kind of growing up with 
cartoons of a certain era um, you know we are inevitably visually um, impacted by um, the aesthetics of the last century so I think that it is natural that people look to the past to try and understand the present and that applies to art as well but something that you say there really does strike a chord um, as you say right now museums are try and galleries public galleries are trying to rebalance their collections and to look at art and to bring women and minority groups into the history to bring them back in um, to the public eye when in the past it, it, it was very much kind of white male art in in galleries and, and museums and I was very fortunate recently to um, acquire a group of works by a female artist from the 1930s who was part of the East London group of um, painters a movement in East London her name was Brynhild Parker and um, she did some very sensitive beautiful um, portraits of East Londoners one of which is a young girl of Afro-Caribbean descent and she was painting what she saw every day in East London um, and so you know those are paintings for which I have aspirations I think that they should be placed in museums and that's what I intend and hope to do um, because people do need to see the work of female artists and of uh, you know especially the female gaze in the past they need to know it existed and they need to know that you know there are you know there were people looking at minority groups um, then in a way that we look at we're trying to sort of look at them today and um, you know in the past if you went to the National Portrait Gallery, you wouldn't expect to see, for instance, a portrait of a black person. It, you know, it's lots of pictures of kind of white aristocrats. And I think that there's a conscious decision and, and it's laudable um, that, that museums and galleries are trying to kind of say this doesn't rep this isn't a fair representation of our history in our country and we are a multicultural interesting place and we have been for centuries and you know it's not just male artists who've been painting over the last sort of few centuries there were women painting mm. as well so I think that that that's a real shift um, and 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 a good, so, and a good yeah. shift. I'm I'm very sympathetic to that. I still think it's extraordinary that you know roughly half your population is still underrepresented in really all walks of life and in everything that we do, and therefore that uh, means that society doesn't flourish uh, as well as it could be. And I'm very interested in uh, minorities, neurodivergent, um, and all of that type of work. But there is, I guess, um, you hear in some quarters a kind of counter argument or some sort of backlash for saying I, and I guess the arguments go or oh, you know these old master works were still really great or there is that um, and we have this argument we've had it I guess quite acutely in Britain but you've had it in other places around statues and and their and their role and maybe we can uh, re reinterpret them but should it all be uh, put by uh, the wayside and people feel like maybe something that they liked or they felt part of has has been diminished i don't particularly see that i, I see it as, as raising a side which should always have have been there uh, but what would you say to people who feel um you know awkward or challenged by uh some of that older line of work perhaps being uh, more diminished or feeling threatened by the raising of of, of this other kind of work Oh, you said to me earlier, if, if you had a different question... <laughs> we can I, avoid no, it. No, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> I, I, the thing is, I, it, I would say to that person, why don't you want to, you know, discuss this? I think that people who can't understand that there needs to be a shift in the way in which we look at society need to look at themselves... 
Yeah, I think that I think that's fair. I think I really think of this still globally, like when people say, and there's the, the shift, and what happens in my work domain quite a lot. Uh, and I just point out that do, do you do you think broadly speaking, the world would be a better place if we had more uh, female power, more all of these type of things? And and I think the answer is uh, unequivocally yes. Mm. And therefore, obviously, there's difficulties, anything, and the nuance and challenges mm. of actually doing that. Um, but you can't help but to say that's true. And and I think it's the same in, in history. You know, there's always been roughly half the population and, and to have it not represented just mm. doesn't seem, uh, uh, doesn't seem a very true, never know quite what the truth is, mm. but seems very far away yeah. uh, from the truth that yes. we had. And for, for someone to suggest that it, you know, by doing this, it's to the detriment of, um, the art that we hitherto have always kind of um, shone a light on. I mean, that's ridiculous, really. And we're not going to stop looking at paintings by Monet just because we think we need to be looking at um, paintings by a, a female artist of the same era, for instance. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I just sort of... And the other thing I think... Well, on that and then I'll move on is that often those artists have been really supported uh, often by um, I, I guess you could call them a kind of uh, uh, a missing woman as in because we don't yeah. often know I, I was really I was reading uh, a story about um, Giacometti so he does these tall sculptures as, as you would know extremely famous well very well regarded and he worked obsessively on his art for hours and hours a day, day, day in, day out. But if you read the story of his life, there was no way he couldn't have done that without the women in his life. Yeah. You know, very short that the sentence, mm -hmm. that's a very complicated domestic life he had. But it was obvious that he could not do his art with, without that. And there's, there's an interesting thing, actually, I'm going to pivot completely around um, something called music therapy or also music enablement and this idea of that uh, we don't the the idea of that anyone creates anything in a void is is even more mythical than 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 the other myths that we have and that that people or men throughout the centuries or everyone the fact that they created in a void is is not true and in fact old masters used to have okay they probably had male assistants and that, but they had big workshops yeah. they had people they had helpers in fact you can see this maybe in damien hurst today and other people you yeah, know they absolutely. have studios and you've always had people to work with you whether they are craft assistants or your family life and how that works and i think it's always been really interesting that it's coming to light more and more how that enablement happens and without that enablement you don't have the art so uh, I do think that is a form of co-creation which historically we've we've undervalued and we still undervalue today I, I, I'm sure but we could have have a slightly bigger sense of how that comes about. That's so true and it's also interesting I think that um, often a lot of artists wives historically um, painted as well mm. but are not as well known as their husbands because they facilitated their husband's creativity and they tended to the family but um i've always thought you could do an exhibition called artists wives are artists too um, <laughs> and um you know especially in the 20th century there was so many so many artists um whose wives they met at art school um, in fact a lot of women in the early 20th century um, went to places like the Slade to study, um, met their artist husbands, and then kind of went on creating but didn't have shows in the way that their husbands mm. did uh, because it was just understood that, that, that the male part of the relationship would be the one that was nurtured. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yes, well, I would put it the, and if they do go off by themselves, they're then often labelled difficult women. Yeah, There's a whole yes, other like exactly. we'll work like, out Barbara that. Hepworth was considered to be a difficult woman because she um, agitated to have representation in New York and London, and she, you know, expected for herself what a male artist would expect, yeah. and so she was labelled a difficult woman. Has, is Hepworth's art now valued about the same as, say, Henry Moore's, or is there still a gap? 
I would say the gap has closed. It's close, closing or closed. Yeah. Okay, last few bits, and then we'll talk about current projects and advice uh, for people. So very short section on uh, kind of underrated, overrated, or kind of some thoughts or comments on where things might go. Uh, so one of this is um, NFT art. So these are non-fungible tokens or this kind of crypto art type thing. Do you think it's underrated or overrated? If we had this conversation a couple of years ago, also uh, it might be quite dif different because you know that ben, market's gone I down. I have no idea. Have no idea. Zero idea. Let's pass. Okay. Uh, next one would be, uh, do you think, uh, I guess, do you think we should have more public funding for art or is it about right or do or should we have less oh God, we should have more Always definitely more. more public funding for art especially in bleak times um we all need places to go to raise the mm. spirits and elevate the soul and you so you don't think it can be supported just by commercial terms no. on the art market no, no no we need more very and, fair yeah <laughs> um and then we briefly touched on this but um AI art or art generated by uh, computers or artificial intelligence or at the moment what's really happening is you're using a prompt so show me a boxer in the style of Van Gogh and then the the um, algorithm has been trained on these sort of images and, and produces these type of things uh, do you think underrated overrated or, or where do you think it will go I think it's absolutely amazing. I know nothing about it. My brother knows a whole lot more. Um, but something that really sticks with me um, is as a teenager, I, you know, in the 90s, I remember him creating these incredible um, AI um, demos um, through programming, these beautiful things that would come out of incredibly complex coding. and was so intriguing. I mean, he, he created, I think he created one of the first codes, or if not the first code, that enabled um, movement in time with music, which was hugely innovative at the time um, and paved the way for um, AI, um, the way, the, the, the fluidity of it today. Um, I think it's fair to say he was a pioneer of that. Um, and I just have huge respect for artists um, who work um, with computers. I think that what they do is phenomenal. Um, and I say to anyone who looks down their nose at it that, that they, they have no idea the craftsmanship that goes into that. It is a type of craftsmanship and it is art in my view. Yeah, I... Uh, and I hinted at this, this is kind of my view on a lot of people who don't really engage, say, with modern art or even conceptual art. And I, I can see why it doesn't resonate with them. But they're, they're, I never find a case where it hasn't been extremely worked upon and, and thought about. Now, you might not value that very, very much. And that, you know, like I say, everyone's got their own taste. Uh, but I, I wouldn't necessarily just uh, dismiss it. So thinking about collecting then, if you wanted to start out and you're kind of interested in maybe collecting some sort of art art which won't seem to you and maybe you have even just a few hundred or maybe a few thousand pounds or however whatever budget you you are what would be your advice to a kind of would-be person starting out thinking about collecting art i would say um there are two things you could do i first of all identify whether you're interested in new art or old art and if you're interested in new art, then go to degree shows, go to graduation shows for the Royal College of Art, the Slade, all these types of places. Um, and you can buy from students and support them. And you can do that for, you know, not very much money and get a beautiful piece of art by an up and coming artist. And, and, and that is a fantastic way to collect. Or um, look at auctions. Um, everything's online these days. It's incredible. Um, you can um, look at all sorts of things on um, the salerum.com. For instance, there's another site called Invaluable. And all these um, regional auction houses um, and global auction houses put their sales online with photographs of things that they have 
for sale and again you can buy things for not very much money at auction and it's quite exciting just think of it as a kind of glorified ebay it's no different and it is you know if you like to kind of truffle out a bargain that's the way to do it very good advice in fact i think i will make that on my list of things to do next year i haven't been to a student show for quite a number of years but always really like them i like them them in design and furniture as well because mm. i quite like the craft stuff um okay and then current projects and things that you're working on so you've moved mm. to uh representing potentially on on pop art uh pop-up gallery type things and a little bit of collecting yourself but any current projects you want to yeah, talk about so I, I mean i i touched on it um i'm hoping to do a pop-up exhibition on Brynhild parker the east london artist mm -hmm. i mentioned who was very active in the 1930s and i have um a group of of her paintings so i intend to do an exhibition um pop-up hopefully in the spring um, so that's my kind of main focus at the moment. Great. And would you like to end with any advice for our listeners? You could think about that as advice for artists or advice for someone who wants to take a career as a gallery person or a mudlarker or anything you'd like to share about your life experiences so far. Oh, my gosh. Um, I... I don't know that I'm the best person to give advice, but I've always done what I love and it gives me great satisfaction. And um, you can always find your people. You can always find your niche, um, you know, even just by going online. It's amazing how the world opens up. And as long as you're doing something that you're passionate about, you should be okay and I think it's okay to monetize your passion as well I don't think it's for instance I mean you know I'm an art dealer maybe I've sold my soul <laughs> I don't know but I mean I I don't see it that way I just think I love art I love dealing in it that's how I earn my living and it gives me great pleasure um, so yeah. that seems like excellent advice so Laurie Evans, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben.